said was true I did start I, I tried to start copying the stones in the Bank Street Cemetery when I was in the fourth grade and if anybody can't hear me holler I'm gonna have my mind on so many other things but uh, then a couple boys in the neighborhood John Van Epps and Ed Harnish were playing in the cemetery and one of the uh, decorations came off one of the monuments and hit John on the head and it, it hurt him pretty seriously so I was out of the cemetery. But I started again when I was in high school. And I go see, I, I became interested in family history and I go see my grandmother and she'd give me these names. So I'd go through that whole cemetery, look at all those 500 stones. And then I go back and see her and she'd give me more names. So I'd go through all those stones again. And then she'd give me more names and I'd go through all those stones again. So I got, I got to stop this. So I decided to copy all of the inscriptions. Well, it never ended. But I haven't copied any cemeteries, I don't think, since 1982. So I did all, most of it when I was in my 20s and in my teens. So when they asked me to talk, this stuff isn't right on the tip of my mind exactly because I haven't thought about a lot of it in 25 years or 30 years or more. So I had to kind of bring up some memories. Uh, and I collected a few things. These these ladies here have stones presently in cemeteries. Uh, many times a family would get a newer four-sided monument and the previous monuments had no value and that's where these came from uh, and so on. So I haven't taken anything. This I got from the Ithaca police. They didn't know where it belonged and I don't either so I can't put it back. They gave me a number of monuments that they found 
uh, in the Cornell dorms and elsewhere. I put them where they belong. <coughs> this one I don't know about. So with that, I want to discuss several things. We're going to uh, discuss some of the value for having records. I want to go through a little bit of the evolution, if you want to say, in cemeteries in Newfield. Uh, I want to go through the way people were buried, and I want to discuss the stones or the markers. If you have any questions, I want you people, I want this to be a group discussion, pretty much. I'm going to ask questions. Feel free to add thoughts, whatever. You might be wrong. You might be right. doesn't matter. Let's make it a group discussion. I think we're going to get more out of it. Uh, first of all, from the gene genealogical standpoint, uh, what would the value be of the cemetery records? Well, when I copy the stone, I would copy all of the inscription, capitals, comma, everything, just like it is, uh, including breaks in the stone. I put the footstones on there. I put them all in order. And uh, when I went through a cemetery before I copied it, I would try to analyze where the burials were. Sometimes the stones got all mixed up. So I tried to do it in proper order, but I would, I would copy the inscriptions just like you see them here. But what value would there be to doing something like that? Just out of curiosity, did you do like pencil tracing? I, I've never done a tracing, no. So you just manually wrote down? <laughs> I wrote down as best as I could read the inscription, including the epitaphs, everything that was on there. What value would there be in doing this? <laughs> yes. Well, not just the data that, but you could get their birth date sometimes from that, family relationships. Um, sometimes they listed lots of information about that person on a headstone. So you could find out quite a bit. A lot of times you find the children mm -hmm. from that. Yes. And for anybody who's gone out into a cemetery, <coughs> the old cemeteries, and that column here is hard to read, there is a way that works very well, and it is not harmful to the stone, and that is shaving cream. Okay. Shaving cream and a spatula. You put the shaving cream on, smooth it down across, it picks up the, you know, shows the letters. Yeah. And when you get all done reading the stone, you come prepared with water to rinse it off. Works great. Any other value for, that's pretty much it. When I started copying the cemetery in Bank Street, when I was, I think, just turned 16, I thought if I copied all the names in here and all the dates, I had a complete record of every death in Newfield. How accurate was that? <laughs> <laughs> How close was I? Okay. <laughs> uh, less than that. Uh, one thing, uh, I'll discuss that in a later. Let me see. The accuracy on these stones, how accurate how accurate are they? Spellings. A lot of problems. A lot of problems. There's uh many times they'd they'd have a small child that would die and they'd put a small child stone up and then years later when the parents would die they'd put a four sided monument up and on the four sided monument they would put the child's names and dates and leave the little marker there and so many times the two don't agree. It's right on the same plot, the same child, right next, the, the, the names are right next to each other and they disagree with each other. And many times there will be two children and if you figure out when they were born, they were born four months apart or something. So they're heavy in mistakes. Up in Pleasant Grove Cemetery I found a plot with five Linderberries and the last name was spelled different on each one of the five. <laughs> they spelled by a sound. But, as was said many times, well, a lot of the genealogies that I have looked at for Newfield families, or most, I find that my cemetery records have some 
or a lot of information that they could have added had they had the cemetery records. As flawed as they are, they added a lot. And part of what you said there was a lot of times you would have, a, let's say, a daughter that died in childbirth at the age of 20. If her stone was not there, then people wouldn't have known of her existence. And many times grandchildren were buried on the grandparents' plot, and with that, you have the names of some of the children. Even though they moved west, and most new fielders moved west, you did have some names. And the name of a one-year-old grandchild that you otherwise would not have known. One thing I did years ago was went through all the Newfield cemeteries. I made a chart so I could see how many people died in each year. Of what value was that and what did that show? I didn't find that. Oddly, that's what I was looking for. I thought, boy, a whole bunch of deaths in 1842 or something. I didn't find that. But what general thing did I find overall? Give you some idea of the population because of a certain percentage of deaths, more deaths, more people. It was to some amount or to some point you did see the population, but generally it was the prosperity of the new fielders. I found a lot of deaths in 1861 to 1865, but that was the most prosperous time, not due to the war, but due to a famine in Europe. And they got the highest prices for the crops. So the people had the money to put up the stones. And then you find times of depression. It was interesting, in times of depression, the amount of deaths went down. Well, it wasn't. It was just their ability to afford the stones. So when I did that whole chronological thing of all the dates in Newfield, it really showed the prosperity of the area rather than the amount of deaths that were occurring. So it really is <coughs> nothing. Okay. For the cemeteries, we talked about the number of burials that these stones represented, or the number of deaths. When Newfield first started, when the settlers first came in in 1800, uh, up to 1820, 1825, whatever, when the people died, parents, children, husband, wife, where would they bury them? Family. Family land. Family land. The backyards. Backyards. The front stairs. Front front yards. <laughs> Where else? In the closet. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they might have, but <laughs> without a bombing. Where didn't they bury them? In the cemeteries. Why not? Where not? And we have a few cemeteries that started as a family cemetery, but not very many. Uh, one thing, I know the there was a census taken in Newfield in 1814, and in the spring there was 976 residents. Now, so during the year of 1814, Newfield definitely went over 1,000 residents. In 1820, there were nearly 2,000 residents in Newfield. And I've looked it up, and the life expectancy was somewhere between 30 and 35 years old at that time. So if you had 2,000 people, and your life expectancy was 35, roughly one out of every 35 people would die, so you'd have approximately 70 deaths, give or take, in 1820. But before, and you can go all the way back to 1814, when there was 1,000 people, there would have been roughly 30, 35, or 40 deaths. So by the time you got to 1820, you had several hundred deaths and burials in Newfield. But in all of Newfield, there's only two burials before 1820 that have a stone. So your 5% is way high. It's, it's considerably less than 1% of the deaths are now represented by a, a proper stone. Yes. There's, there's no record. Yes. So the, yeah, the life expectancy is if you were born, how long could you be expected? So many of those, I think in the Bank Street Cemetery, over 
are less than a year old. And the likelihood of an infant receiving a stone is a lot less than an adult. So, but still, well less than 1%. And I'm, I'm just assuming or guessing. You know, I try to, over the years, I've been destroying, I think, 33 years and some. There's time after time, somebody died in Newfield and there's no stone. And, and, and after a while, they just didn't have cemeteries. Now, going from 1820 to 1825, in all the town of Newfield, there are 13 stones. And how many, that list that was handed out, are many of you familiar with those cemeteries or not? Are you? Oh, uh, yeah. You, okay. Um, I have a question on it. I was just going to give you more of a question than anything else. The Wood Cemetery, Cuda, found a ship of Cuda sort of up and down that's in the cemetery. No, okay. We'll <laughs> talk about that later. No, okay. I want to kind of keep it focused. It is. it is Woods. There's three stones there. It's not Ennis. Uh, There's two Ennis cemeteries I know of. But okay, then do I have the wrong spot across from the chicken farm? Oh. Yes. Behind, behind Birdie Lamford? Yep, that's a different one. Okay. That's on us, but different than this. Okay. Also, isn't there a cemetery where Taggart Road comes to north end of Taggart Road, along that road that goes down, and Taggart Road ends on? Isn't there one back in the woods there someplace? No, there could be. Where there is could be. Where you saying? Uh, I think. It's right where Tiger Road ends, on the north end of Tiger Road. And I it's about to be a bus trip off road, Tiger yeah. Road intersection. I was in and out of those feet, that, that, those woods all my life, and I don't ever remember seeing a gravestone. I don't recall one. I've been, well, there was we, we, we were out on a hayride one night. <laughs> we had the kids out from church, uh, yeah. and, and, they, and a bunch of guys jumped out of the woods right there, and they told us that there was a cemetery there. There could have been. There could have been. Uh, okay, from 1820 to 1825, going through all of the Newfield cemeteries, there were 13 more burials. Two were in the Nettle Cemetery. Ten were over in the Bank Street Cemetery. One up on Connecticut Hill, and two in Sebring Corners. A few people know where those, some know where I am. Of those four cemeteries that had burials that were marked between 1820 and 1824, really, what did those four cemeteries have in common? There's one factor that each cemetery had. Bank Street, Nettles, Connecticut Hill, and Sebring Corners. As far as location. No, no. Hank's getting close. A school. They were all next to schoolhouses. Now, why would they have a cemetery formed right next to a schoolhouse? Over on Bank Street was the first cemetery in Newfield, the Yellow Schoolhouse. And in the 1860s, the cemetery bought it. And it was right there where that little piece of lawn is and to the east of it. Uh, Nettles, the schoolhouse is still there. Connecticut Hill was a, some, or a schoolhouse right next to it. Hank's mother taught in it. And Sebring Corners had a schoolhouse right across the road to the, on the northwest corner. So all four of those cemeteries had schools right next to them. Why would they be next to the schools? Because they use the schools for churches. Yes, yes. And since they used the schools for churches, they used them also for for funerals. They used them for funerals. So generally, the earliest cemeteries started next to a school. <laughs> well, some weren't, but most were. And there was other cemeteries in Newfield that started next to a school. Irish Hill is one. Cutter is another one. What came first, the cemetery or the church or the school? The school. The school was 
predated the first burial in Cemetery? Yes, yes. Yeah. They, they'd start the school up, and because of the lack of transportation, a church in Newfield would have branches around the town. You know, they couldn't come in from Irish Hill on a Sunday, so they'd have their Sunday school out there. And then they had this cemetery right across the road from them. So they had little Sunday schools, and that's what they call them, Sunday schools all over. Uh, yeah, and they let school up. Lockery and I went to see a lady up in Herkimer. She, she grew up and lived in Manhattan, uh, Dora Decker, and she lived to be 110. But she told us that she remembered down in Jackson Hollow that they would let school out for a funeral. So. Yes. Well, wasn't it common though to have funerals in people's parlors? <laughs> yes, it was. A little later, I would imagine. Oh. More after the log cabin in Newfield in the 1865 <clears throat> census, over half of the homes in Newfield were cabins or log buildings. So you know, with a log cabin, you don't have a parlor. But you get more to the 1870s and 80s and 90s. See, as you, you got the nice farmhouses. Uh, and a lot came out of the prosperity of the 1860s, then you'd have the funerals out of the homes, out of the parlors. Okay. Uh, then a little while later, they started having cemeteries that were more convenient for the community. Uh, Esterbrook Cemetery is a good one. Uh, another one is Chafee Creek. And cemeteries like that, you think that's a real old cemetery, but the first burial in Esterbrook was in 1852, which really is somewhat recent. If you were going to look up to see how many, how many burials, how many stones are in Esterbrook before 1852? Okay, there's there's four in there. But why would, if you go look at Esterbrook and copy all the stones, you know the first burial was William Esterbrook in 1852. Why would they, there be four stones in there that are earlier? They brought them in. Yes. They moved the bodies. They moved the bodies. Possibly created stones then. Why would they do that? They wanted them out of the backyard. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's basically it. Out of They were still on the farm. See if... If you lived at a place in 1830 and you buried mother up under the apple tree, and you, you moved to Michigan in 1840, you know. But if you still lived there in 1855 after Esterbrook started, well then you'd get mother out from under the apple tree and you'd bring her down and give her a stone. Could there be anything left at that? Possibly not. What is this and when I uh, met a gentleman, I don't know if you ever talked with him, Fred Esterbrook from Ithaca. I've, I've heard of him, but I've not talked with him. Well, he's a descendant of the Esterbrooks, and we met last fall, and he brought, he has quite a few things. In fact, I invited him to come tonight because I thought he would be really interested in that. <clears throat> but he actually has the original book of the Esterbrook Cemetery Association with all the people's names handwritten. It's, okay. Um, I'm sure she'll come and show you. Esterbrook Cemetery was an organized cemetery, and as a cemetery, when you look at Esterbrook, do you, do you people know where that is? It's the cemetery halfway out Pony Hollow on the left going toward Elmira. If you look at the cemetery from the road, you think the left half is very busy and very filled, and you look at the right half and it's basically empty. In 1880 or 1881, the cemetery, the Esterbrook Cemetery Association bought that right half. And so they were enough of a corporation or an association to buy land. But what else happened in 1880 or 81? Woodlawn started. <laughs> Woodlawn Cemetery started. So the, in the middle 1800s we had some of these community cemeteries started up other than the schoolhouse cemeteries. Then in the 1860s up to the 1880s we had another type of cemetery that started up, and that was these incorporated large cemeteries that did landscaping and plotted things out and sold lots, and they didn't remember who was buried where by memory and so on. And that was in, in the 1860s, the cemetery on Bank Street became incorporated. They purchased the schoolhouse land on the west. 
they purchased the land on the north that goes up to Bank Street, and they purchased extra land on the east, oh, down there in that little corner. So they became incorporated, and they got fancy. And when the trees come down, I, I try to count the rings, including one that came down in the 50s, and it looks like those trees were planted in the 1860s. So that was part of their landscaping, those Norway spruces that have gotten so large. Uh, in 1881, the Woodlawn Cemetery started up, and that had an impact on the other cemeteries as well. You take all these little cemeteries, and the, the smaller ones like Cutter and Estabrook and Chafee Creek and Sebring Corners, basically the burials ended in the 1890s, right after 1900, because the people ceased to bury in those anymore. They wanted to go down to that beautiful woodlawn that has the snowball bushes and the circle in the middle and all that. Alan, are, are any of those other cemeteries active? I mean, could you be buried in the other ones? Or is it you can't, it takes it takes a while. Trumbull's Corners is still active. That started around 1858 or 1860. Bank Street is, yeah. Will they bury somebody at Sebring Once in a while, but it's it's more red tape. They don't know where anybody is up there. There's no uh, so officer. Yeah. Yeah. It's harder than it was. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, in Woodlawn, the first burial was in 1881. A little boy named Charlie Sebring. And I've gone through the stones, and there are 44 people that have names on their stones before the first burial there. And that is from two reasons. First is they brought mother up or whatever, like you said, uh, to give her a more proper burial. Plus, a lot of these cemeteries that they brought bodies in, my grandmother told me about two people in Woodlawn, uh, 1850 and 1885 were their death dates, and they were buried up on Birch Hill in the woods. Mm -hmm. And they just simply, it was proper, and one was a woman's mother, and one was a man's wife. Uh, and they just brought them down to give them a more proper burial. But what are some of the other reasons you have stones up in Woodlawn with a name and a date previous to the first burial? And I, you know one of them. <laughs> well, I have an ancestor that died out in Missouri, and his body was left there. The widow came back here, and she wanted to remember. So she has her name on a stone, and she put her husband's on there as well. And that, that happened a number of times. There's a number of names on stones up there that just plain, they're not there. They're buried somewhere else. And you can find their stones somewhere else. So, but there's, there's 44 stones in Woodlawn that have names and dates that predate the first burial. So there were a lot of people that brought their relatives in and reburied them. Oh. Okay, for the cemeteries, uh, for the old cemetery, what what did they generally plant on the ground? Myrtle. Myrtle. Oh, yeah. You know, you go out in the woods and you see myrtle. Good chance there's a burial there. What other thing did they plant near them? Myrtle and what else were a good sign of an old cemetery? No. Old-fashioned roses. Haven't seen many. What others? Lilacs. Who said lilacs? <laughs> lilacs. <laughs> okay. Something else to look for in finding old cemeteries. I, I used to get this thing where every time I turned around, I said, is that a cemetery? What other thing? High areas on top of a knoll. Yeah. They didn't do that always. I heard about a cemetery in Benetton between uh, the turnoff to Swartwood. Well, it's near Swartwood, and it was near the railroad tracks. And I've heard of a couple people that knew about it. But they said, and since it was down low, they said if they buried somebody in the spring, they had to load rocks on the coffin to sink it. And that's real. But see, that cemetery didn't prosper. 
<laughs> that's, an, that's an exception. They generally buried them up high. Uh, also, I thought, you know where Sullivanville is? Just before you get to the, going toward Elmira, just before you get to the first off to Sullivanville, there's a cemetery right on the right. It's a fairly good sized cemetery and they're capable of several hundred burials. There's only 17 and the earliest is 1886. So apparently that was a organized cemetery that started out and there was just competition so it never made it. But the burials are sprinkled all over in there. And where did you say this was going toward Sullivan? On Route 13. Mm -hmm. Going toward Elmira, it's on the right, just before the first turn off to Sullivanville. You can barely right see it. Does any Hubbard's? Beyond Hubbard's. Beyond Hubbard's. Just Beyond. before the turn off, and there's a little sign there now. But not all cemeteries made it. But you get up to the 1880s, cemeteries started to be business. Mm -hmm. So in in 60 years you went to a little bit of a cemetery up behind the schoolhouse or the church to business type cemeteries. So a bit of an evolution there. Very different. How often do you find the records that go with the cemetery that went with the, church, the school which was part of the church? Most of those, I mean schools and churches generally have a record, would not the cemetery have a record also? Well, Sebring Corners had records. That was an incorporated cemetery. Uh, no idea where the records are. You know, I just heard about Esterbrook having records, but it'll be interesting to see what kind of records they have because often, like Troubles Corners and the Bank Street Cemetery, the records are only of lot purchases. So the records, they don't have any burials, they just say who bought this lot and it has four burials and they paid four times $25 for it and that's, that's the entire records. Uh, Woodlawn is the only cemetery in Newfield that has burial records. So sometimes they were lost, many times it was only for the lots and then once in a while on the bigger cemeteries they had actual burial records. They would have death date. Grove Cemetery in Trumansburg has excellent records. It has death date, burial date, and reason for death. That's rare. Grove Cemetery in Trumansburg. Trumbull Corner Cemetery has good records too. Lot records, I think. Really, a Barrett. When I went to see Ken Allen years ago, all he was able to show me was lot records for the I old think, stuff. I think Nelson maybe has. Uh, so since then, Nelson has been keeping, been Nelson keeping burial turned records. Nelson's turned it over to someone else. Nelson's turned it over to somebody else. Yeah. yeah. But, see, I haven't done this in 25 years. But yeah, when, I went to years see, ago, went when I went to see Nelson's father, all Ken had was burial, but that, or uh, lot records. Okay. I know the meticulous is Nelson, and he, he, he would be driven. If he had a lot out there and didn't have a name onto it, he would yeah. he would be sure yeah. there was a name and that would be the right name. Yeah. Sean and I need to go, but can you tell us anything about the Hines Cemetery before we do that senior our house? Well, oh, is it really? Yeah, That's a family you. cemetery. I think the earliest burial is 1849. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody in there, I think, is related to the Hines. And if you can't see how, I'll get together and I'll tell you how each one of them is related. Okay. But it's a, it, it's a family cemetery. It's, it's very nice. It's, it's pretty broken up now. Yeah. Isn't that the one you dug up with the mobile? I don't think so. <laughs> I, not that I haven't done it, but I don't remember doing it for that one. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I've seen bones and coffin handles. Those woodchucks are busy guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Yep. Okay, for the graves, what kind of graves did the early settlers have? Did they have big fancy caskets with concrete vaults or what did they have? Wrap them in a blanket? Possibly. You know, a lot of this, I've, I have never been able to read anything. It's just from observation. Like you take the woodchucks have given, given pretty good clues. So have finding graves that people dug up. Oh, that, that's terrible. There's a, one on... Uh, oh, I found a number of them. The, the so ones bad. on Connecticut Hill are deeper than any I've ever seen. But why would that be? I've seen a number of graves that have been opened up over the years. But why are the ones on Connecticut Hill so deep? They dug on the wrong side of the headstone. <laughs> <laughs> they did. <laughs> yes, they went quite a ways before they give up. They never found anything because they, they should have dug on the back side of the headstone. Instead, they dug on the front side of the headstone. <laughs> So, What's the depth of graves? About 18 inches no, or less. No, it was six feet under. No. Around here, you couldn't get six feet under. They didn't have to conform to the state regulations in those days. Even Woodlawn is basically five feet to the bottom of the grave. So. So, this six foot under, that's, that's, and if, if you were in January and February in 1840 and you had to dig a grave, would you go down six feet or would you go down just enough so the animals couldn't get to it? Yeah, on frozen ground. They cover it over. I've, I've seen graves where they've only taken a foot of dirt out and I see uh, wood remnants of coffin, I've seen bones, casket handles and stuff, so they're not they're not deep at all. So so these really early burials be very similar to what Green Spring is proposing? Before eighteen sixty. Yeah. And Matt's Matt's probably right on that you go back to eighteen ten or eighteen twenty, they might not have even had the resources to even have a casket. Mm -hmm. And if they did, it would have been simple. Remember, everything, they were hard up for everything. Mm -hmm. Are yes. there any records of where the actual stones came from? Once in a while. Once in a while there is, but not often. You know, no, I'll, I mean, about they, these? Yeah. No. Where did they Sometimes you see it on the bottom. This stone has been messed with. I'll, I'll get into that. But Sometimes you can't... Maybe one out of a hundred will tell, and you have to look for it. It doesn't jump at you. They also must have people that engraved. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep. If it was on the bottom, you wouldn't see it because. It would be well, they didn't put it right out in the open. Okay. I have a question on the Connecticut Hill cemeteries. There's a book down in Ithaca in the library called Cemeteries of Tompkins County. Great book. And one of the things they have talked about is the Hendershot Brown Cemetery. Now, there's a Brown Cemetery, there's a Hendershot Cemetery, and there's a Hendershot Brown Cemetery. On the left-hand side, of the the main. Yeah. Uh, there used to be a brown road. Is that Dora Pope Warden's book from 1925? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Hendershot is out in Pony Hollow. There's two browns, and Hendershot Brown is probably the one on the corner. Because there were Hendershot graves out in front, but you can't find them anymore. When they widened the road, they kind of. And the corner of what? Boylan <clears throat> Road and Connecticut Hill Road. So that would be the Hendershot Brown Cemetery. Okay. Uh, yeah, for the body. So they would bury them possibly without caskets. What direction? How would they place the bodies? Would they just 
bury them at any direction out in the woods, or would they? <coughs> Say that louder. East, so that the sun would rise on yeah. the places. Well, well, okay, you're right. I read that so far. He's I think that's Native American's way of doing it, isn't it? I wouldn't think so. Honestly, I don't know. I wouldn't think so. They, they. The graves were always at a perfect east-west direction, or very close to it. So if the deceased was to sit up, he would face the sunrise. And you can you can see old cemeteries, like down at Inlet Valley. You look up on top of the hill, and you see the stones are all to the different direction than the rest of the cemetery. It's because up on the top of the hill, that's the earliest graves, and they were east-west. And then when they got organized, they made all the graves parallel to the road, or perpendicular to the road. But they, the burials were always east-west, with the head to the west. Yes? The stone was put at the head? The stone was put at the head. Yes. I've even seen stones for when they put the stone up, they put it over the casket on a child, and the stone sunk right into the casket. And so I found one of those in Enfield, and so when they cleaned the cemetery up, they found the top of a stone that was flush with the ground. They pulled it out, and here's the whole child's stone. So it slipped right into the casket because it was over the casket. Yes? Didn't they reuse some of the stones, too? Yes, they did. How do you know which inscription, or did they totally obliterate the original? Or? Well, they used them in different ways. Sometimes, just like this one, I don't know what they reused it for. It's like countertop or something. Can't, can't figure that out. Yeah, yeah, but you, you find stones, footstones like this, where they put it at the foot of the grave, and there's times where I've seen the back will have a date or age or something on it. So they just took a stone like this, cut it in pieces, and used use the other side for a footstone. Yeah, this, this stone here I found under a foundation. On our property, uh, we dug up uh, one of our walks. <coughs> a, a gravestone, looked over. Yeah. We've been walking on it for 15 years. <laughs> yes. I was curious, since there were so many Indians in our new fields, are there any Indian burial grounds? There weren't many Indians in Newfield. No villages. No. The Indians generally had their villages down lower, but as far as I know, there was no villages in Newfield. So the Indians settled. That was that was later. That was much later. That was just before the Revolutionary War, and they didn't stay long. So there aren't there aren't any. They were only here 10, 20 years. I don't. I don't know. See, it's the same as the, there are literally hundreds, I would expect many hundreds of burials in Newfield before 1825 that there's no evidence. And every once in a while, you can find a, a cemetery. And uh, if you find three indentations in the ground that are perfect east-west, you have a good chance of having a cemetery. But after 180 years, in the woods, and the leaves blow across, and where do the leaves go? They sink into the low areas. You know, after so many years, and also with the farmers, they, they would have no reason to believe there's a grave there. Uh, it's plowed under and leveled out. So you really, very, very unlikely to find many of those early graves. Wasn't there supposed to be an Indian, Indian burial ground around Hector someplace because I know for many years a lot of people have been digging around trying to find that. Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. Hector is a big place, so there, there's supposed to be one right down here by the creek, creek behind uh, Coffin Indian House. Era? Yes. But, you this know, was how would you know? To be a large one. Yes, Harry? I can't let the Saponi Indians slip by without. Uh oh, that cave. About putting it to the whole group and their collective wisdom. How accurate the local legend is about Sullivan driving his ponies in the cave on the east side of... <laughs> You'll have to talk to uh, Bob Missouri. No? No. Jim Morrell. How is Jim? Yeah. He's pretty poor. Oh. 
I don't know how to use right now, but I we did an interview with him and he had some interesting things to say about that. He said he knew where one thing was that he would not say where it was because he felt it was sacred. You're going to say something about Alpheus Crawford? No, I was going to say that my mother's brother went down into that cave once when he was real young to the top. And there was a, I think there was a cow shot at once when they blasted oh. the shot. Yeah. That was story. Yeah. Well, what was Alpheus Crawford to you? Great, great grandfather? Great grandfather. Great grandfather. Well, Hank's great grandfather was Alpheus Crawford, and he lived out in Pony Hollow where Hank's mother lived. And he was a great storyteller, and my grandmother remembered him. And one of his stories was going into that cave and finding all sorts of Indian things in there. But he also said he lived out in Pony Hollow so long he could remember when the creek flowed the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that on where so that kind of. That's a long so, time ago. So, so the answer to the question is it's still local myth. Yes. There's something to it. There's something to it. I've seen newspaper articles where they've taken classes out there and explored the cave and found things, but boy. The cave is yes. Yes. You'll never know. He's talked about it. He's been to the cave. My father talked about it. He's been to the cave. And his father was walking along with a crowbar. Big long crowbar. It was walking along and it went right into the ground and we never heard it hit. Yeah. <laughs> There's stories. <laughs> okay. Got it yet? To my For, knowledge, oh. the case and dynamite, I was at the spot once. There's a big depression in the ground, that's it. There's a lot of caves out there when you really get down to it. And caves out in Pony Hollow. We, we, we can't get into that. We could spend a half an hour into that. In, in stories and all the rest. Another lecture. That's yeah, some other day. Okay, how about husbands and wives? What, what Did they use any rule as to bury the husband on the left or bury the husband on the right? Yeah. Just You think they... I've heard that they buried the husband and the wife in the same position that they stood when they got married. But you know, I've gone through cemeteries to see how many are on the wife is on the right, and you know, at the altar when they get married, the wife is on the left. And you know, it's about 50-50. It's the same in divorce. I just can't. <laughs> 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 Not been able to determine that there's any rules that they ever used. They just did it. East West is very definite. How deep we touched that. How about embalming? When did embalming start? Civil War. Civil War, yeah. That really brought embalming on when they needed to send the soldiers home. Before that, embalming didn't exist. How about shrouds? Know anything about shrouds? In later years, they did use shrouds. You know what shrouds are? Mm -hmm. It's the clothing the people wore. The cloth. cloth was so valuable, they take the backside out of the shroud many times. So really, as you saw the person in a casket, if they had a viewing, their backside was naked and the front side would have a suit on or something. But uh, They still do that today. Do they? I don't know. I'm I wouldn't. Asking. That'd be interesting. I think if you don't have something for the person, they just. Oh, they have cheap. Something from the funeral home? I don't know this. Oh, they have. My father had a child. They, really? They also have suits that have no pockets and so on. They look like they have pockets, but they're pocketless and so on. But they did have shrouds, but when you were dealing with homespun, that was an awful lot of work to get rid of. Okay, markers. The first markers, when we go back to the settlers, what kind of markers would they have had? And again, this is kind of guessing because there's not much left to look at. But wooden, ones? Wooden, ones. Wooden, ones. wooden ones? Stones. Just stones. Trees. What kind of stones? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cemeteries, mm -hmm. in some cemeteries you can go in, you can see a lot of these field stones. And they'd have a head and a foot stone. And uh, 
They've left them there. Rolf Cemetery is a good example. You can go out there and you can see 25 field stones, but in some cemeteries, when the people went in to clean them up, they, they, they take those stones out, which is the bigger case. Uh, out there on the old Payne Road was a cemetery right where, where they built a house. They built a garage pretty much on the cemetery. And on that uh, place, they had little granite stones head and foot. And there was maybe four or five graves in there. But they were just simple. Sometimes if you look real careful on those stones, you can see initials and a year scratched in. And I've seen maybe a dozen or 15 of those. But you, you, they're not really, they're not cut in like that. They're basically scratched on. And you can find them, but you have to look for them. That's why this I found on our place up uh, on Van Kirk Road. And I don't know if this is a stone or not, but you can see the initials MS are carved on there. And the first people to own it were the stars. So I don't know if that is some star. I don't know if this is a stone or what it is. But it could be a uh, grave marker. The wooden ones, I would have to think there were a number of wooden markers, but then they're gone. And so the population was so transient uh, that only 10 or 15% of the people that lived here at any one time actually stayed here. And I've only seen one wooden stone when I copied, and that was over in Manhattan. And it was just about a quarter of an inch thick, and it's gone. It was gone shortly after. And I know when I took my barn down, uh, the siding, it was an 1880 barn, and I took it down about 100 years later. The siding up near the soffit was a good inch thick, but where it wasn't covered up by the board under the soffit, it was only half an inch thick. So in 100 years, the weather had taken a full half inch off that hemlock siding. So even if the board did stand up, the chances are, you know, there are probably a lot of wood markers and they just can't last. Probably also depend that on the wealth that you're supposed to have access to. Yes. I'm sure that people on the East Coast, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, like that, were very familiar with uh, stone. Right. Out of right. Yeah. Uh, when would this type of stone start showing up? Marble. 1771. <laughs> oh, good try. When would this type of stone start appearing? This marble type of marker. After the Erie Canal. In 1825. Because obviously they had to have a way to get it in. And if you lived up on Connecticut Hill or Irish Hill or in the village here, uh, it'd be pretty expensive to get marble in from New Hampshire or Vermont. So not until the Erie Canal generally could people even, uh, well, they, they didn't even try to get it in, I don't think. Rare maybe, but this is Slater Shale. So that was quarried locally. So this type of stone, 1825. Uh, the burials were marked with a headstone and a footstone. We've touched that. This would be at the head, obviously. This, here are two footstones. And that would be at the foot. Now, as far as the burial, where would they have the writing facing? Any idea? Was there any rule to that? or? <coughs> Generally, how would they have? Moving on live, they usually put the surname on one side and the writing on the other. That's later. That's a lot later. No. But it's done like that. The the written part would face <coughs> away from, away from the grave. The foot yeah. The footstone would also be the written part away from the grave. Now, there were exceptions, and the Enfield Christian Cemetery is one exception. They're not common, but that is where if you have to enter the cemetery from the back side of the grave. You know where the Enfield Christian Cemetery is, just the other side of Enfield? That's where when you enter from the east, most of the stones, except for a few up in the back, when you enter, you read the stone from the foot of the grave. 
instead of going around to the other side of the grave. But if, uh, if the cemetery is, if the road is on the, going the side of the cemetery, so the road is going east-west, the writing is always readable from the west. And they did have, the, the uh, standard was to have a headstone and a footstone. Why the use of footstones? It was just to mark the foot of the grave. And you know, on a child's grave, it, it'd be, they'd be two feet apart or three feet apart. On an adult grave, it'd be six feet apart. So I have a feeling that like Hannah's stone there, the marble stone, I got a sneaking suspicion that when they ordered that stone, the engraving was done in some far off quarry where the stone originated, but not, and not locally. Could be. Could be. It's a different stone. It is extremely rare to have the birth date and the death date and the age on that type of stone. I'll bet in the 30,000 stones I've copied, I haven't seen that five times. So that is very that rare. Have? To have the birth date, the death date, and the age all on one stone. The standard is like this one over here. You have the death date and the age. They never had the birth date on them. Never. Well, the thing that I think I'm seeing in common, and I, and I will say every marble stone I've ever seen of that vintage, but one is that the, um, the style of printing is almost always the same. And I found uncorrected mistakes on the marble stones that if it was done by, you know, the, the actual engraving was done by somebody local, they probably may have corrected it or um, <clears throat> would have cut a new stone or something. Yeah. Or, or maybe yeah, the, that one was very different. They also cut the bottom off. So they used it for something. They used it for under a fireplace, or I don't know what they did with it. But they... Atwell. 1880s, 1890s? Oh, yeah. I just assumed that that's where it was. No, it was right there in the, where the gas station, or where the covered bridge market is. Oh, it's just across the road. Yeah, the yeah, the yeah. yeah. Danny Atwell. When did undertakers, when did undertakers really start? A lot of early ones, just within a family one day. When did the undertakers start up? I don't know, middle 1800s. There were, there were men that would be farmers and they'd be carpenters on the side. And there were men that would make a coffin. And I think the family would, I'm guessing, probably just take care of the burial. But as far as a proper undertaker, probably middle 1800s. And an undertaker always was a furniture store. And they'd make furniture, they'd repair furniture, they'd sell furniture and they would do caskets on the side. You know, it'd be part of their <coughs> furniture business. Uh, let me see. Now, what kind of stones did this thing have? Well, be like made. this. So, so he would have engraved yes. marble? Yes, yes. He, he would have cut these marble stones. These, uh, these stones went out about 1850. They were pretty much gone by the 1830s and the last one. This is 1844. But this, this was just about the only style in the 1850s. About the 1860s, the four-sided pillar obelisk stone started up. There was also a type of stone, and I'm not so sure if that one isn't, maybe it isn't, I can't see from here, but they, they look like they had a concrete veneer face. Not familiar with those. 
So we've seen them because the face is actually pieces of the concrete that pulled away from the stone. Water seeps in, freezes. I've seen some concrete ones. These will peel or mm -hmm. laminate, but. Now, how would they do engraving in, like in the stone on the left? What tools would they use to make fancy? I don't know. I've, I've talked with. Well, I talked to Gordon Belknap down at Glenside Monument, and he said they just took a, a mallet and a chisel. But uh, and it made it as fancy, as fancy letters. Somehow, yes. I've seen stones where the epitaphs and some parts were not finished, and they'd have uh, outline letters. So it looks like they took something and they outlined the letters and then they cut in and made it deep like this. Now this stone looks like it was never finished because it's so flat here. Maybe it was, but you see the letters are very shallow. And here it's cut deep. So this, this stone almost looks like it wasn't finished. But again, I don't know how they did it. On this, and sometimes when the stones come out of the ground, you can see where they practiced. And on the bottom of this footstone, there's practice here. Sometimes you'll see letters and numbers and all sorts of stuff down on the bottom of the stone. But when they put the stone in the ground, they concealed it. But it comes out, and so you can see where they played around with it and practiced. So I don't know how they did it. So after after about the Civil War, they started with the four-sided stones. After the Civil War, they started with the foundations. Instead of just putting the stones right into the ground, sometimes they put a shoulder on it like this. So you couldn't pull it out. And this is a slight one, and there's one over here, but sometimes you come up two or three inches, you couldn't pull it out. Uh, but then after the 1860s, they started having foundations. But then the paste or the glue they put on the foundation had sulfur in it, and so with rain, it would turn into sulfuric acid. And uh, many times it cut the foundations right apart. So they destroyed themselves. Did you mention about Captain Drake's stone? Did you mention about Captain Drake's stone in high school? Also, I wanted to ask you, um, if you were, if you were to do now today, what you did uh, when you were a teenager in the twenties, would you be able to read the stones like you put them? No, a lot of the stones are gone. A lot of the stones are just plain missing. They've stolen them out of the cemeteries. Uh, and with the acid rain, uh, many stones are gone. There's stones that I've read that have completely dissolved uh, from when I read them. They, they turned into sand. So with the acid rain, it is really eroding the stones. Right. Captain Greg Stone, what, what did you want me to <coughs> Oh. Captain Joseph H. Gregg died July 3rd, 1863, age 26 years, fell while nobly leading his men at bayonet charge at the, ba of, the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, what the, what's the epitaph? He died for his nation's sin. Yes. Yeah. No, Where did he say that again? He died for his nation's sin? Yes. Where's the... Where's the it's in the back of the Bank Street Cemetery. Mm -hmm. And over towards close to Main Street. It's right down in that point. Mm -hmm. That point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's about seven, eight foot tall. And the more research they do on the Battle of Gettysburg, they find that Captain Gregg was a very important part of the outcome of that battle. I won't get into that now, but mm -hmm. after that, Ken Burns fell a lot of people did research and wrote books on the Battle of Gettysburg, and they found things that Captain Gregg did, did that they didn't even realize before. So he was a pivotal part of that outcome of that battle. Uh, talk to you about that other time. But very important man. After 1895, we start seeing the granite stones. You know what they are. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1930s and 40s, we got these very boring stones that we see now. <laughs> That's about it. Hello? Yes, sir. During your course of going through all, there must have been a ton of rather <laughs> humorous epitaphs and stuff. And I was just, have you ever? <laughs> <laughs> That's what people. 
I've not seen any. There was a... Oh, boy. You know, they write these books on all these hundreds of funny things. Well, they must have been lucky because of the 30,000 stones I've copied. I've only seen one borderline. And uh, another, never, there was one up in Cutter Cemetery. Uh, how did that go? They left me here to molder and rot, but never to be forgot. <laughs> it's awkward. That's about the most humorous I could think of ever finding. No sense of humor with Congress. Apparently not very serious. <laughs> but none of this, uh, I told you I was sick. You know, any of that. Well, pay attention, I'm only doing this once. <laughs> yes. What's the legality to stop and visit a abandoned cemetery? Should you contact the landowner or do you have any other Yes, site? yes. I, boy, if it's an abandoned cemetery, I suppose if it's on the tax maps, recognize them the tax maps, it's town property. You know, I know of cemeteries around Newfield where people have gone in there and say, get off, this is my land. And I thought that's what, and people have come and told me they've been kicked out of that cemetery. And I think that's curious. So I went down to see Kathy Krantz and I wanted to see this on the tax map. And she showed me where there is, this cemetery is recognized as a cemetery on the tax map. And they mail out the tax notice to the town clerk. So definitely nobody had any right to kick anybody off that land because that is officially place. town property. Yeah, I didn't think a person could be kept away from the cemetery. Well, I've been chewed out more than once by being on somebody's That's private land. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so but, what about restoring some of these cemeteries? I mean, if, if I had a cemetery on my land, I would want to keep it up and you know, keep the grass down and that I sort just, of thing. Is there an organization to do that sort of thing, restore old cemeteries? Well, if it's, if it's a, a properly abandoned cemetery, I don't know how you'd say that. It's, it's town responsibility <coughs> legally. Oh, okay. But if you, you have some of these cemeteries that have five or ten graves, and they are not a proper cemetery. They are, not, are legally that landowner's property. See, then you get kind of hazy. And there's a lot of cemeteries that are like that, a lot of little ones. Yes? The word properly maintained is going to be interesting with the new cemetery we got here. Oh, yeah. And you know, some of the best cemeteries to copy the stones were some of the ones that were least maintained because I've seen cemeteries where it's, it's just a jungle in there and I could go through and I would find a headstone for every footstone and I'd find the pieces and I'd come out of there kind of scratched up pretty good but I, I had a good feeling that I found every stone in there but then you find some of these and I've seen cemeteries get all fixed up and then the stones start to disappear yeah. so you know it's <clears throat> This is a good time of the year to go to the Ennis, that one Ennis cemetery that's in the shrub. Oh, yeah, because on the, on the hillside. the bushes are not yeah. so big. And this, the last few weeks are the best time to copy because the ground is soft and you can find the stones that the woodchucks have buried and other things have buried. If you wait a few months, the ground is hard. You can take uh, probes, long screwdrivers or whatever, and you can find the stones. And I found a number of stones that have been eight or ten inches under the dirt. Yes. I think we're all going to miss Les Gainer. He worked for the probation department yes. with his yeah. people on probation. <coughs> Maintain a lot of cemeteries. And he's gone. I don't know if anybody will pick up the rings. Mm -hmm. right. He said. Historical society should do that. Oh, great. Another project, please. <laughs> Everybody here join and we'll uh, I will cemetery restoration. <laughs> There is a law on the books of municipalities you're supposed to take care of once a year, twice yep. a year. There's a law on the books. Isn't there a law on the books that the person who brings the idea up has to <laughs> 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 yeah, I brought up before. <laughs> <laughs> for, for inscriptions, I was going to say, 
That pretty much is the standard inscription. Name, wife of, son of, daughter of. Once in a while you'll see the, the word relict, which is wife of, then the, the relative's name, and then died, and then the age. And they always or generally had the age in years, months, days. Now that one was no months because she was only 44 years and 14 days. And then uh, it was frequent to have an epitaph. And most of the epitaphs were standard. You know, you'd see the first word and you knew the rest of it. But you had, a, I, I read it carefully because they'd have misspellings or there was some variations to it. But apparently they had some sort of literature where you could pick your epitaph. Neither of these have epitaphs. Yes? You almost wonder whether they had some kind of stencils or something because the lettering on most stones is pretty doggone good. And to do that by hand... Yeah, I say yes. That sounds sensible, but a number of times I've seen where uh, you have a name like Daniel Cavanaugh here, and it starts up, and then they, they ran out of space, and they have a little A with an arrow to it. So it's not rare to see where they run out of room. Okay. Or you can see the other direction, Daniel Cavanaugh, and they run out of room down here, so they have a little arrow here with an H up there. And they just plain run out of room. Yeah. And if they did it with a stencil, Probably. they'd see that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that's just rare examples when they didn't use a stencil. But there's nothing, no written literature to tell you about this. It just doesn't exist. How do they do it now? It looks a lot of the same. They do stencils now. They sandblast them. They yeah. yeah. They'll make a stencil. They'll tape it right out. Uh, they'll cut it out of a piece of rubber, and they'll put it right across the stone, and they'll put on a whole mask and gear, and they take the sandblaster and just go right at it. So, different world. Have you thought about what kind of stone you would choose? Nope. <laughs> Should I? <laughs> yeah. I was going to talk about how to read stones, but I don't. I think you're looking kind of tired. No. You know what? When you're looking for the old cemeteries, especially in Connecticut Hill, you will find. You can look and look and look and never find the cemetery because the tree has taken the stones up. Oh, yeah. And you look up and there's the stones of the cemetery. I've never seen that. There's okay. one on. Uh, I don't have your chat right now. What? Please excuse us. Oh, okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I haven't seen you since you mowed your lawn on the corner. <laughs> The one, the one that you have listed, uh, we call it from hand of shadows. Um, let's see here. I think, I think it's a Jedediah Brown cemetery. So you have listed. That's got stones that have been lifted out of the ground and they're now living. Trees. Really? Mm -hmm. The last time I was there, it didn't. But no, it's not there. I mean, the trees I have in the cemetery. I don't. Never seen that. Can I explain it? Okay. I didn't know that. Um, who was just asking me about it? You were. Okay. Is that the one? No, I've not seen that. I'll take you up there sometime. You won't find it without a guide. I guarantee it. Unless you spend a lot of time up there. <laughs> the only one I don't know of. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, for those that are interested in the customs of cemeteries, there's an interesting display at the uh, Salt Work Museum in Syracuse. They have a room set aside with the, you know, the old cemetery customs, which is it's worth the trip. This is the salt works. Yeah. That's with, in with the same museum. It's uh, up by the north end of the lake there. Yeah. They, made, they made salt in those days, just like they did maple syrup with big cauldrons. It's, it's interesting. Hmm.
Ms. Lynn. Somebody mentioned it earlier that Hannah Chafee might have been a countertop. There is a headstone in the Cortland Historical Society that was used exactly for that purpose. A house, an old house had been renovated. They flipped the stone over, they used it as a countertop, and then when they, years later, renovated this, this house, they took that countertop out and it was a, it was a headstone. And they had it on display at the Cortland Historical Society. But, yeah, they used stones for everything. I, I copied a cemetery in Trumansburg, and the owner came up and said, I got some stones down here by the house when you're done. And so after we were done, it was a sidewalk. So we pulled the stones up and copied the stones from the sidewalk. So. I'm oh, oh boy. Steps up and you call them, they say they don't know what to do with this downtown. Yeah. People measure steps in your house. Yeah. They have no records, they just go. So. Doesn't mean when you call, they didn't want to care nothing about it. That over at Trumbull's Corners, if there's a house, and, that the steps for the house were all let go, turned well, over. There, there's a number of cemeteries that have just plain disappeared and the stones have been used for whatever reason. Those people went to move their, their steps, you know, put a dick, uh, deck on, and all those steps were. Yeah, yeah. And they called and they said they weren't interested in them or know anything. They said it was before any books were kept. What's yeah. that? Happens a lot. Yes, Hank. Uh, is there a cemetery down in the down Station Road? And, uh, Yes. It was right up on top of that hill that doesn't exist. Yep. It's entirely flat. It was right up on top of that hill. Where is that? Down at the end of Greenville. So where's the bodies? They they went for fill on the roads. You you must remember that cemetery, or don't you? Yeah. Yeah. They just dug in, and the stones and everything came down. They just put it right in the trucks and used it for fill and construction. I understand a lot of them disappeared way before somebody lived down there, put them in a made up Yeah. When they took the house down, it wasn't there. Willie Ellison told me that, and I checked it out when they tore the house down, and there was nothing there unless they covered it up with concrete. So I couldn't find them. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, you know, I'll just have to talk about that stone. Okay. As an interesting point, maybe, uh, I was stationed up on Cape Cod back in the early 50s, and we used to take long walks. And uh, at that time, the Mid Cape Highway was only a two lane macadam road. And we were walking down the road, and we went by a cemetery. And there was a tombstone with the name Barry, I remember that, B-E-R-I-A. And in the time of death, the date of death was in the very early 1700s. And we walked to the first house past the cemetery, and the same name was on the mailbox. And we were quite interested in that, so we went to the door to find out it was the same family, but there was no one at home. And I thought that was quite interesting. It is. It is. Okay. Anything else? I have a buddy up in Canada near the Canadian village. And when they built these seaway in the, what, 50s? They were going to put a lot of cemeteries and they put the stones and built a brick wall and embedded the stones in the side of the brick wall. It's like a maze. And quite, uh, quite attractive. Well, that was one way to preserve them. Yep. I guess they fluttered over the It's uh, you find stones all over. You know, my original dream of copying every stone <clears throat> is long gone, because you know I copied Chaffey Creek Cemetery, and then ten years later I went through to check my copies, and there's stones, just plain gone. Uh, and and people use the marble, and everywhere their stones are gone, the stones are rotting away. Mm. But you can, I'm glad I did it 40 years ago because I recovered a lot that would be impossible to do today. A lot of it. Yes. Thank you, folks.
All right. I'm going to love them. <laughs> Bad habit. This is, this is red. She loves that. <laughs> we want to thank you all for coming. We're planning... Um...